All right, we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to our panel today. Um, our panel promises four participants, and you can see two uh, before you currently. So Kim Shambop, and it's sort of ironic that we're sitting here in beautiful Los Angeles. She could not get out of Chicago based on weather um, yesterday. She tried all day yesterday to be with us. So Kim will not be here. Um, uh, and then uh, Donald Tibbs had a personal emergency, which, oh, there's just three of us listed. OK, so they got a hold of Tibbs in advance. Uh, our panel today is Whiteness's Aesthetic Properties. Uh, Nick Shulo and I um, have worked together uh, many times over the course of uh, our careers. In fact, Nick was a student of mine when I was at West Virginia University College of Law. And we both have been thinking about the aesthetic nature of whiteness in our um, scholarship recently. Uh, Nick is going to talk today um, about uh, Richard Sherman. And while I'm a former NFL player representative, um, I actually love Richard Sherman's antics, and I would have loved it as an Asian. Um, so we'll hear what Nick has to say about Richard Sherman, who plays for the Seattle Seahawks, in connection with uh, the aesthetic um, whiteness properties. I will be talking today about corporate borders and um, the property of a good photo op. I've actually written an article that's going to be published in the Washington University Law Review um, about white male supremacy as it continues to dominate in corporate boardrooms across the, the country, and, and maybe world, but mostly the United States. Uh, Nick Shulo is a PhD candidate at Georgia State University. He is writing his dissertation currently. He teaches in the communications department at Georgia State. And I am the interim dean and a professor of law at Indiana Tech Law School, which is a brand new law school in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where we are seeking to become the foremost leader in experiential, integrated education across the curriculum at uh, Indiana Tech. So with no further ado, uh, let's start talking about whiteness as aesthetic, aesthetic properties. And uh, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers and conversation. So uh, we'll let Nick get started. Uh, I will have to say, I, I built a lot of jokes in here anticipating more people. <laughs> so they, they, we'll see how they go. Um, if no one ever laughs. If, well, wouldn't be the first time. So this panel is concerned in one way or another with how whiteness is performed. Uh, this question is important because it necessitates a reckoning with these ideas of speaking white, dressing white, passing as white, and the like. Who is black? Who, uh, who is white? You know, years ago, whites used to determine intelligence and criminality by appearance. Uh, you know, we can imagine who that worked out best for. And now there's this, this fellow uh, who some of you may be aware of, Mark Cuban, uh, who's afraid of a black guy in a hoodie uh, who would move to the other side of the street, um, which seems shocking uh, at best. And so clearly there's something about appearance. And I don't know what you think about uh, you know, this idea of moving to the other side of the street. Um, but it seems to me that if I was trying to get anywhere, I would constantly be moving and I'd never get there. Um, you know, I mean, to be afraid of someone you know, of color or, or in a hoodie or heaven forbid both, uh, make the day very long. Um, the point is that there's something material about aesthetics. Uh, material in, in affect and material in effect. And, and of course there's this idea that, that affect and effect are, are not as different as we might think. The, the cause and effect, uh, I think, are transactionally related and not linear, linearly related. Um, so we need to think about the ways in which appearance regulates and enforces um, the ways in which we conduct ourselves, and then also the ways in which um, there are impacts to uh, our own appearance. So aesthetics is both an epistemic and ontological component, and um, what you look like is a component of your ability to succeed in the knowledge economy and be a conduit of knowledge, because knowledge is never aesthetic and neutral. And it's also, it also influences what you are, chattel, slave, you know, a horrible list of racial slurs, animal, monster, maniac, sexual predator, criminal. Aesthetics matter to identity, performance, and construction. So what is this interest, I guess, I have in Richard Sherman's dreadlocked head? Um, it's interesting the, the way in which we turn Richard Sherman in, into this character that is just dreadlocked guy. And there's a, a 
for an example that will resonate for, for Dre and I, uh, there's an example um, of a player on the Pittsburgh Pirates, Andrew McCutcheon, who's relatively the long dreadlocks down, midway down his back. Um, All-star great player in the contention for, for the MVP this year. Um, and, and there are shirts that depict him with no face and just with a hat and dread. So it's this black, um, the Pittsburgh Pirates colors are, are gold and black. It's a gold shirt with a black outline of Richard Sherman. It's a hat and dreads, no face. Kind of interesting uh, the way we do this. But so back to Richard Sherman. Never mind uh, that Sherman had a nearly 4.0 GPA in communication, uh, which we're very proud of in the communication discipline, uh, from Stanford. Uh, and I have a joke in here about Stanford because I thought it would play well to a UCLA crowd. We'll just, we'll just skip that one. Um, but but, you know, Richard Sherman isn't a Stanford graduate cornerback. He's a dreadlocked cornerback. Uh, it's, it's as if his dreadlocks were themselves a defining feature. Uh, you know, he is the dreadlocks. Um, and, and who has dreadlocks? Uh, not white people, not Stanford graduates, uh, not humans, not men. Animals, black animals. And it's that idea that Aaron Andrews, uh, and I'll give you some more of the context of this interview that I'm interested in uh, a little bit later. Um, but Aaron Andrews, um, and, and I'm not a Southern person, although I'm in Atlanta, and, and in Atlanta we say these thi this thing called bless your heart uh, mm -hmm. when you do something that is problematic. And, and I think that this is applicable here uh, to Aaron Andrews, who has a really awkward interaction, interview with Richard Sherman, um, and then there's a series of back and forth apologies and descriptions in the media um, that happen in, in strange ways. And if you, you can Google these and YouTube them. Um, really interesting stuff. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about what happens in these interviews and the apologies, which in many ways seem more problematic. Um, so on January 19th, 2014, San Francisco 49ers faced off against the Seattle Seahawks in the NFC Championship game at CenturyLink Field in Seattle, Washington. The game, a hard-fought struggle between two superb teams, ended with the Seattle Seahawks winning 23-17. to The Seahawks would go on to win the Super Bowl by defeating the Denver Broncos. While the NFC Championship game was in itself interesting as a sports competition, the media devoted much attention and pundits bandied about a post-game interview of Seattle Seahawks defensive back Richard Sherman conducted by Fox Sports reporter Aaron Andrews. And it's this interview and the ensuing reactions which interest me. So in this article, and I managed to cut out many of the steps I was making in anticipation of not going over my 15 minute allotted time. Um, in this article, um, I analyze the context and content of this interview, uh, setting the stage for a larger discussion of rhetoric, racial animus, and the myth of the boogeyman. Um, I consider the evolving rhetoric of black danger in law and media situating the coverage of the Sherman interview in this larger discursive framework. Then I expanded the discussion of racial animus in sports media to encompass the pernicious myth of the boogeyman. Uh, lastly, I analyzed the myth of the boogeyman in history, paying particular attention to its coloration in German myth in a painting by Francisco Goya, KVNA El Coco, if you all are Goya fans, uh, to consider the now racialized violence that exists by the construction of Richard Sherman as modern day boogeyman. Uh, and there are a number of internet uh, reports about the Sherman interview that actually use this kind of boogeyman language, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, underlying this examination is an abiding concern for critical race theory as an analytical lens to critique identity politics, performance, and racial and ethnic discrimination. The problem with modern racial thought is that it fails to realize the legal racial irony and liberal contradiction of race, or of the frustrating legal case of meaningful reform that has eliminated blatant hateful expressions of racism indicating both a reasonable frustration with the machinations of legal change and a dangerous propensity to ignore the subtleties of more modern forms of racism. And here we see this in this idea of post-racism. -race um, we, are, we are not racist, cannot be racist, racist might never have been racist. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, the commitment to critical race theory is born of a deep concern for the hostility white America harbors from black and brown people uh, as far north as Canada and as far south as Chile. Indeed, as, as the frontispiece to Kevin Hilton's Race in Sport, Critical Race Theory suggests, critical race theory provides a framework for exploring racism in society, taking into account the role of institutions and drawing on the experiences of those affected. So what's the short version of this Richard Sherman story? Sherman gives an on-the-field interview, uh, as athletes are prone to do, and he's super jazzed because he broke up a very important past 
um, that arguably won the Seahawks the game. And he's loud and confident and happy and gives the interview and runs to the locker room. And Aaron Andrews looks a little scared, a little upset, um, because Sherman didn't give her as much time as she thought she should have had and didn't really answer the questions she asked. And so there's this awkward moment where she's staring kind of blankly into the camera. Um, the, the, the folks with, in the studio that she's conversing with are also kind of paused. There's just awkward silence. Um, Sherman's then asked to apologize, uh, and he initially refuses to do so. Um, but it seems that uh, the team and powers that be eventually kind of coax him into giving an apology. Uh, Andrews then plays it off as if the apology wasn't necessary, nothing ever happened. Um, and, and to be sure, I, I don't believe the negative reporting on Sherman uh, or on the Sherman interview was Aaron Andrews' fault or doing. Uh, I think she's trying her best to do good things. Um, and she indeed reports uh, in interviews about this interview uh, that, she, that it was awesome and that she loved it. Um, all well and good, but it's Aaron Andrews' comments later in the interview about the interview that suggest a more complex and problematic relationship between Andrews and athletics. In the interview, Andrews said, quote, you expect these guys to play like maniacs and animals for 60 minutes, and then 90 seconds after he makes a career-defining, game-changing play, I'm going to be mad because he's not giving me a cliche answer, end quote. So Andrews has positioned athletes in general, and Sherman in particular, as expected to be maniacs and animals. This debasement is consistent with that which James Baldwin identified in the 1950s and 1960s as part of whiteness. He argued that whiteness blinded whites so that they might only see, quote, the Negro they wish to see, end quote. And I hope you'll excuse kind of the ocular centrism of Baldwin because he's making a valuable point. How on earth can people of color be recognized ontologically or epistemo uh, epistemologically? Frighteningly, and, I, and maybe Aaron Andrews kind of gets at this, they might not be able to, as, as Charles Mills, for example, has argued. So race functions in the field of the visible. Uh, in this way, it is not sufficient to claim someone, Sherman, was acting black, because this, performance, uh, this performative critique resists the ontic qualities of racialization. This realness or materiality was born in the commodity come slave. As Stephen Best writes, slavery is mediated by the commodity, which manifests, quote, a particular historical form of an ongoing crisis involving the subjection of personhood to property, end quote. This is to say that viewing the commodity form inherent in slavery as distinct from anti-blackness today is both illogical and ahistorical. It is not that Richard Sherman made visible his blackness, but that his blackness made him visible, which then served as the precondition for his critique by the media, or put another way, his visibility made him invisible. In this way, the haptic form of the commodity assumes the ontologically shattered body of blackness, which allows whiteness room to maneuver using its refined politics of oppression. And I want to talk to you some about this idea of the boogeyman, because Richard Sherman is depicted as a boogeyman man in some commentators' accounts. So the boogeyman myth uh, has existed for centuries in many countries. It is a relatively simple story about an otherworldly creature that kidnaps and eats children. Uh, the figure is often represented as black or dark in coloration. Uh, this monstrosity has many names across many cultures. And monstrosity has, of course, been central to the articulation of law. Uh, you know, law is monstrous in many respects. So there would be no large stretch of, the intel of intellectual acumen of careful law consumers, and I say consumers uh, to those of you who are students, which might only be one of us. Um, because there's an economy uh, that you participate in in this building, you know, in your home department, to consider the ways in which law um, mirrored, if not was informed by myth. So myths rely on narrative theory structure much of our lives, so then that we may find a resemblance between modern day racial discourse and myth is not so much unique as it is another beacon for continued critical concern for the racialization of popular culture, law, and in this instance, sports. That the legend of the boogeyman maps so neatly on the evolving discussion of Richard Sherman is necessarily a cause for concern and continued investigation. In the words of Joseph Conrad, quote, there is no peace and no rest in the development of material interest, end quote. Indeed, and, and well said, Conrad highlights the material impetus for continued racialism. We ought not expect such interest as extricate from the Richard Sherman affair. We ought to assume that racialization is in fact motivated by capitalist concerns. The blacker and scarier Richard Sherman is, or O.J. Simpson is on the cover of Time magazine, the more scared we become and the more magazines we sell. Joan Dayen eloquently writes, quote, legal structures give flesh to past narratives 
and life to the residue of old codes and penal sanctions, end quote. Seen this way, race becomes something carnal, both metaphorically and actually. It is not the, that slavery simply informs present racial animus, but today's legal institutions, in fact, help to create slavery's past and present. The narrativity of racial animus means it will never disappear. It will be told and retold. It seems, and, and Dane here is uh, concerned with Orlando Patterson and Claude uh, Messaloux's notion of social death, uh, that in this way, the living who are dead are in fact quite boogeyman-like because of the realness of their falsity. They mirror the monster under the bed and relay notions um, that a lot of folks have, have talked about, both in the context of race and terrorism uh, and other issues of identity. It is natural, then, to read the boogeyman into law because Dan argues, in a manner of speaking, this is already being completed. If the black body is seen as always already criminal, is ontologically monstrous, what remains is not social death, but is instead socialization of antisocial life. This is to say not that Richard Sherman has been cast as dead, but that he has been made to live as though he, the interviewee, were of some singularity apart from social reality, of discrimination and social death. So we're kind of removing him from the social. I've written about this sort of process and the complexity of death, blackness, uh, social construction in life in the context of, of one of our modern ontological masters, Tupac Shakur. Dre and I uh, had, a, had a good riff at a conference in Atlanta about uh, the genius of Tupac, so it seems only right that we mention him here in Los Angeles. And since I've been listening to K-Day radio since I've been here, uh, I, I've become much more acquainted with Tupac. Um, so I see death, uh, in some sense, as life, and death's radical alteriority as a precondition for life. Why? Um, because it is the dehistorical singularity, the idea that social death is something that deems blackness to ontological otherness. If it is true that singularity is attempting to be less than nothing, uh, and, and that the construction, or in that, that construction, nothing and less than nothing, uh, on the same side of the coin, that what are we to make of blacknesses less than nothingness? So I'm very concerned with the idea that we, that blackness either exists prior to um, social interactions, but is also articulated as a product of social interactions. And, and I think that there's this tension that, that uh, legal scholars and other scholars kind of have to work through. Um, and here I go on uh, a, a relatively uh, interesting riff on on my, my favorite person in the whole wide world, uh, Slavoj Žižek. And I guess we'll do that because we have so much time and clean it out just wouldn't seem right. So Slavoj Žižek, uh, a, a Slovenian uh, philosopher and cultural critic uh, who most folks have at least heard of in passing. Uh, indeed, he's tough to avoid, uh, particularly as he's kind of taken to the internet and now pops up all over the place. Um, engages in a Lacanian Hegelian reinterpretation um, of, of nothingness, and, and he's pulling from a number of other uh, related think thinkers, Heidegger, Nietzsche, uh, I, I think Gianni Vatimo, and, and others. And Zizek writes, and, and there's a long quote here, uh, he says, it is thus crucial to distinguish between the two nothings, the nothing of the pre-ontological then of less than nothings, and then nothing posited as such, as direct negation, in order for something to emerge. The pre-ontological nothing has to be negated, has to be posited as a direct explicit emptiness, and it is only within this emptiness that something can emerge, that there can be something inside of nothing. We'll try to unpack that. So it is then not so much that less than nothing is nothing. Indeed, it's quite not that. Nor is it that less than nothing is lower than nothing, or this is to say there is no lower than nothing because less than nothing in blackness is only reflection and reflector of whitenesses less than nothing. And this is, this is an idea that, that uh, Anthony Farley, who, who Dre and I have, have worked with uh, before, uh, who's at Albany, uh, talks about. And, but here it seems that, that Farley and Zizek may be at odds. Um, is less than nothing something? Is this pre-ontological position a place we can do something? Um, is less than nothing, in fact, a simply a flavor of nothingness? Zizek's nest, less than nothing must be negated to create something, in the same way that nothing as direct negation can produce something. These two nothings are distinct, yet both are preconditions of something. So what on earth can legal scholars make of this? Why is this guy talking about this stuff? 
Legal scholars must consider less than nothing that pre-ontological condition before nothingness can be determined as nothingness enabling other. It is less than nothing, I contend, that creates nothing. And here, perhaps, I'm just making the enthymeme of Zizek's argument um, more clear. Um, therefore, the less than nothingness of blackness is the precondition for racism's materiality. It creates the nothing that is doing, that is doing precisely what is expected, which is nothing, but not less than nothing. In short, doing nothing is doing something. This, of course, seems counterintuitive. How can that which is less than be less than without that which is less than? Uh, that's a wonderfully constructed sentence. Here, Zizek asks us not to conflate nothing and nothing, for it is in fact that we need not fear nothing as such, but perhaps should fear this nothing of not acting. So at the end of this talk, um, I want to conclude with the idea that we must think about how to articulate a positive politics of blackness is nothing. Like, what can we make of blackness's ontological qualities? Uh, and how do we compare the ways in which uh, there may be a pre-ontological category for blackness uh, or for other identity markers? What, what do we do with that uh, in light of the ways that we typically think about identity as forming um, identity, or the way we think about blackness and other identity characteristics as forming identity in a social world? So if whiteness is allowed to control blackness as other, then we've missed an opportunity and whiteness will continue to fill the fissures of black identity. And I think that's what we have happening here in the Sherman incident, where blackness, is, blackness has been given away or, or just taken, thefted, as it were, by whiteness. You know, and, and Aaron Andrews gets to kind of articulate the story of Richard Sherman's blackness as super and awesome and a fun interview, and I loved it, and there was no problem, uh, and whatever. But we see that that's not exactly the case. Um, as, as the internet and other sports commentators kind of take to and articulate a different version of blackness. So I think that if we're going to like move forward in terms of articulating ideas of blackness and understanding the ways in which whiteness is concerned with blackness's aesthetic properties, then we have to do a better job reckoning with issues um, like dreadlocked Richard Sherman instead of defensive back, great playmaking, Stanford graduate, almost a 4.0 GPA, um, quarterback, articulate, nice, it seems like, seems like a good guy if you've ever seen a Richard Sherman interview. Um, because we're not concerned with that uh, in the aesthetics of whiteness. We're only concerned with the monstrosity and evilness that is somehow his dreadlocks. So, thank you. Thanks. We got, I forgot to pull up the internet. Is that going to be doable here? I said I forgot to pull up the internet. Do we have a connection in class? A connection to yes. the internet? Got it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've been concerned over the last decade or so uh, with corporate leadership in the United States. One of the things that has been very apparent to me as I've taught my corporations and business organizations classes for my students is that I often have my students seek corporate diversity statements on their corporations' websites. And we find that nearly every a United States uh, corporation has a robust diversity statement and a deep commitment, according to them, in their diversity statement to diversity. So my students always, I have them 
pull uh, the diversity statement, bring it to class, and have them talk me through how committed they think Coca-Cola, McDonald's, uh, Nike, IBM, Service Master, uh, General Motors might be to diversity. And then we begin talking about what the website looks like, these firms. And I have them go to law firms' websites and kind of look at pictures and look at the corporation's websites. And you would think, by looking at websites and looking at diversity statements, that our corporations in the United States and that our law firms, particularly the most uh, prominent law firms, are not only deeply committed to diversity, but that it's present at their, at their institutions. Um, and so then I have my students drill down, sort of look into what their corporate leadership looks like. And one of the things that's been very interesting as uh, we've gone along over the last few years is that apparently there are lots of really pretty pictures of diversity that are present on these uh, law firm websites and what have you. And in fact, some of my students have begun to find the same pictures on different firms' websites. And then we begin to imagine that maybe this isn't a group of people that work at that law firm, but in fact a picture, a photo op, if you will, of these particular um, firms trying to show how diverse they are in fact. So this is a common uh, law firm photo op that I looked when I, when I uh, looked on the internet for common for law firm diversity. Uh, and then I entered, uh, the, and, the, and you can actually just call and buy this one, uh, this particular picture if you want to, but corporate board diversity includes uh, pictures that um, look like a particular company uh, believes that only when you're diverse will you be able to be successful. So here's another picture of corporate uh, board diversity. If you want to buy it and put it on your website, Shutterstock, I'm sure we'll be happy to sell it to you. Here's another picture um, that I found when I was uh, looking at corporate board diversity as well. So you see lots of different faces of color, you see different ages. What you don't see, uh, looking back, is you don't see a bunch of older white dudes. You just see one sort of older white male in this picture, uh, there's one in this picture, and there's one in this picture. And uh, you would think that these firms are sort of deeply committed if you look at their pictures. But what I wanted to do today was to talk a little bit about what the reality is of corporate board and law firm diversity. And I decided that I was going to use a firm that I represented when I was in practice. So I practiced in Chicago for a number of years at a large law firm there. And we represented Service Master as one of our uh, large corporate clients. And Service Master, if you are not aware, is is a company that comes in and cleans up your house if it's flooded, or they, they actually have a Merry Maids service uh, that Service Master provides. So they're kind of like a catastrophic um, flood recovery service, but they also provide lots of other services all around serving uh, your home and clean, cleaning up the corporate and home workspace. So I wanted to pay very particular attention to what Service Master, as typical, says uh, on their website about diversity. So let's look first at Service Masters About Us Corporate Social Responsibility. I, I found this interesting when I worked for uh, Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, Service Master was formed as a Christian corporation and it was initially named Serve the Master. Uh, later changed it to Service Master, and now you can't really find anywhere on the website any links to Christianity, although they talk a lot about becoming responsible corporate citizens. It talks about their giving, the environment they care about protecting, their ethical code of conduct, etc. But let's look at what they say about diversity. Okay, so this is Service Master's commitment. I like the picture. You know, everyone at Service Master, employees, or what have you, there's lots of women, lots of faces of color. Everyone's very happy to, we, to be working at Service Master. And they say, embracing diversity is critical to how we treat our employees, customers, and suppliers. Their diversity and inclusion provides programs that attract, retain, and develop diverse talent. 
provide support systems for groups with diverse backgrounds, educate associates. We want to create an inclusive workforce where employees are recognized as valuable contributors to our winning team. Okay, so I want that to wash over us for a minute. And then we're going to go to our corporate governance link. We're going to look at a picture of who actually represents this company. Keep in mind the picture we just saw and the happy, diverse faces. And here are the leaders of ServiceMaster. CEO, CFO, President, 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 President. It's not until we get to human resources that we have our first female and then a supply management female, possibly of color. But what we have here is a co deep commitment to diversity. And if you look at the corporate executives day to day, or the board of directors dominated by old white dudes that have probably created a diversity statement, but it doesn't apply in almost any large corporation to executive leadership teams. It doesn't apply to the board of directors, it doesn't apply to corporate executives. So here we have a nine, a 10 member board of directors, two women, no persons of color that I can detect. Uh, of course, it's always kind of dangerous to just go by pictures. And then in looking at the names, they don't show uh, faces here, but looking at the names of the board of directors, uh, there's one female, Sarah Kim, maybe of color, but all the rest are, are men. And my guess would be probably, um, probably white men. Um, and, and for, you know, sometimes I forget, for those of you that aren't corporate people, uh, the Board of Directors is the group of leaders that meets four, six, eight times a year. Uh, typically, uh, for companies like Service Master, they'll meet in fancy places and hotels um, to decide the goals and the going forward uh, um, trajectory of the corporation, while the day-to-day -day executives that we just saw a picture of are the ones that run it, um, run the company on a day-to-day -day basis. The Board of Directors hires the day-to-day um, the -day executives. So I want to go back really quickly to our picture about diversity and their commitment. And I often ask my students if, in fact, this company is so deeply committed to diversity as they claim on their website with their picture, why aren't any of the leaders diverse? Why are all the leaders um, white, white men over 55, 60 years old? And this is the first time often, as those of you that teach probably recognize when you bring up issues of race and critical race, uh, the students are stunned, astonished. They don't know. They don't know. They take. They assume from the pictures uh, that the corporation is deeply committed. And Cheryl Wade at St. John's calls what I'm describing diversity double speak. Corporation that talks about diversity that makes it a core principle, and yet in fact uh, she often meets with corporate executives in uh, New York City, and she'll meet with them at the fancy corporate clubs and what have you, and she is always the only person of color and typically the only woman in these gathering places of corporate leaders where deals are made and um, you know, high-end uh, mergers are struck and what have you. So let's talk then about the reality of um, corporate leadership in the United States. Together with Cheryl Wade and Stephen Ramirez at uh, Loyola Law School, we've just completed an article called Toward a Critical Corporate Pedagogy and Scholarship. This article will be published in the Washington University Law Review in the, the next couple of months. Um, what we did was uh, Cheryl, Steve, and I all teach corporate law. And we gathered together the five most popular corporate law textbooks in the United States that are sold, um, that almost every law school's law professors teach out of. So um, I, would, I would guess, estimate, that probably 85% of law students are taught out of the five corporate law textbooks that we gather together. And then we together, with the help of a couple of very diligent research assistants, read through these textbooks page by page. And we started to look to see if any of these issues of diversity double speak or corporate social responsibility were discussed or lectured on or presented in any of the leading corporate law textbooks. And we were maybe not astonished to find, but a little surprised to find that not one of the leading corporate law textbooks 
that we teach out of in the United States contains critical race examinations of what's really going on in corporate American leadership. And what we believe that does is that all of the leading law students, sorry, all of the law students from law schools that will become business leaders, and we know that many law students go on and um, aren't just lawyers, but they become general counsel for large corporations. Many of them start their own companies. Many of them become our business leaders. They're taught corporate law from a perspective that presumes that what exists is natural. That 87% of all corporate board leaders are white men when they make up far less than probably 33% of the population in the United States is how it is. It's a natural order of things without any critical examination of any of the issues that I list up here on the board. And so we expect, once we publish this article, that there will be five casebook authors that will be very upset with us um, for, and, and one of them teaches here, so, um, that will be very upset with the fact that we're suggesting that we are negligently, or at least purposefully, training our law students in a way to presume that whiteness and white male supremacy is the natural order of things. Okay, so let me talk about a couple of these things going forward. The public corporation of white male supremacy. 87% of Fortune 500 board of director seats are sat in by white men. Sorry, 85% of Fortune 500 corporate board seats are peopled by white males, 87% by white folks, meaning 2% by white females. That means that only 13% of all corporate board seats of the Fortune 500 are sat in by persons of color um, and, uh, and women. Fortune 500 statistic, we're at a bellwether year. 18 out of 500 Fortune 500 companies are led by women this year. And it's a bellwether year. It's never been this high. When I started talking about this, there were maybe three or four. Ursula Burns at Xerox is the only female person of color that leads a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. And as I suggested before, there are only 18 with Melissa Meyer at uh, Yahoo and Christina Romati um, at Hewlett Packard, I think, maybe, being a couple of the, na uh, of the recognizable names of women that lead Fortune 500 companies. So we have an un critiqued white male supremacy that continues in the United States and all of the leading corporate law textbook authors refuse to discuss this and treat it as if that's how it is, that that is normal. Now, once you imagine that most CEOs and almost all corporate leadership are white men, then we talk about some changes in the law over the last 15 or 20 years that make that prospect horrifying, in my view. One is that the CEO has become the most powerful position in the United States. We, our law has essentially neutralized any ways to challenge by law uh, corporate leadership. The, the duty of care has been mostly eviscerated. The duty of loyalty, uh, the duty of uh, good faith, each of them militate in favor of corporate leadership and it has become, through the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, extraordinarily difficult for shareholders to sue corporate executives for any type of malfeasance. And so we believe, Steve, Cheryl and I, that the CEO has become the most powerful position in the United States today. And you have to believe that's true if you paid any attention to the financial market crisis and learned that what our government did was essentially give unfettered bailout money to corporate executives that had run their corporations into the ground through, in my view, reckless risk-taking. And we supported this corporate leadership with reckless bailouts. Uh, and no accountability. There isn't a single um, a Wall Street perpetrator of the, of the financial market crisis that's sitting behind bars currently. And there was securities fraud, um, in my view, that was rampant at the time. So the CEO has become the most powerful person, and that's peopled at to, to 500, 18 divided by 500, yep. percentage, whatever that percentage is, by white men, primarily. 
Okay, Citizens United, uh, 2010, I believe the opinion came out, which allowed unfettered uh, um, corporate uh, treasury funds to be di diverted to politicking and electioneering. So essentially, the Supreme Court, as you probably know, held that uh, corporations have a um, First Amendment right to free speech, that our campaign finance laws restricted that. And so we changed the law so that rather than PACs, political action committees, being the primary driver behind politicking and electioneering, where people had to take money out of their own pocket, contribute it to a PAC for the PAC to, in fact, electioneer, Citizens United said you can use general treasury corporate funds to electioneer. What does that mean? 85% corporate board directors being white men now have unfettered access to their treasury funds to electioneer in ways that they feel like best protects the corporation, but ultimately we know that best protects them and their positions. So corporate leadership now has unfettered ability and access to general treasury funds, and shareholders don't even have any opportunity to weigh in on, wh on whether or not the money that's being spent in politicking and electioneering is in the best interest of the corporation. There's no way to challenge it. Um, so we've essentially basically transferred enormous amounts of power and wealth to these corporate boards and corporate leaders that I hope I've uh, demonstrated are primarily white male, primarily elite, and primarily uh, conservative, I would think, in most respects. Then we get into this problem of the recent trend of privatization. Um, my scholarship is focused on the privatization of prisons in the last couple of years. And uh, corporations like the Crutches Corporation of America and Geo Group now engage in, in mass incarceration for profit. Um, for those of you unfamiliar, it's probably the, the everything I'm talking about today, I, I think, is devastating. Uh, but that's probably the most immoral um, act activity that we as a country have allowed to transpire in the last decade, I think, which is Corrections Corporation of America and the GEO Group, both run by corporate boards of primarily white elite uh, males, have the opportunity to profit based on mass incarceration. So I'd like to imagine, as I, as I often do when I do a presentation on private prisons, imagine we're a board of directors. And we're meeting together around a beautiful oak table somewhere in a exotic locale, Hawaii or, or, or St. Kitts or something. And what the responsibility of the board of directors is to do is to talk about how to make more money, earn more profits for shareholders, and talk about the corporation's vitality going forward. And if we were sitting around that oak table, and we're the Corrections Corporation of America, and now I'd like to show you the board of directors of the Corrections Corporation of America, that's, that's this group here, um, what would we be talking about? What would our conversation be if I was John Ferguson, the chair, and I said, how are we going to make more money next year so that our shareholders uh, increase profits. Now one of the things that I always point out here is I don't know how this happened, but Thurgood Marshall Jr. sits on the board of directors of CCA. Um, probably hurts his dad's feelings um, to know that. I've actually, I went to Howard Law School and so the legacy of Thurgood Marshall is very important to me and I've reached out to Goody a few times to try and talk to him about what he's doing on the CCA board and he won't, he won't, he won't return my calls. <laughs> Um, and I've met him a few times, but at any rate, this thought exercise we're doing is we're sitting around a boardroom table talking about increasing profits as a private prison corporation, and the only thing we can really do is talk about incarcerating more people, building more prisons, passing laws that incarcerate more people for longer periods of time, and in fact incentivizing legislators to incarcerate more human beings. And in fact, that's what they do. CCA and GEO Group spends millions of dollars, dozens of millions of dollars a year lobbying legislators for more prisons, harsher sentencing, more crimes that, that um, put people in prison, and the war on drugs, of course, and now the war on, Im on immigrants is, it, 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 well, the war against immigrants, if you will, has led to these private prison uh, corporations 
um, becoming extraordinarily prominent. And one of the nefarious, pe one of the most nefarious pieces of this is that most of the times that private prisons contract with governments to warehouse their criminals, their prisoners, they require 90% occupancy rate at the prisons that they fill or else they're in breach of contract and have to pay more money. And so municipalities are incentivized to fill their prisons to 90% capacity in order to avoid breaching the contract. So the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that every single thing I've just discussed with you does not appear in a single corporate law textbook in the United States. It's as if corporate law exists to continue to entrench elite white male um, leaders and shareholders. Uh, finally, Too Big to Fail um, is, is also not Citizens United, Too Big to Fail. The, the idea that if your corporation becomes so large, Bank of America, um, uh, IBM, um, Chase Bank, if it becomes so large that your executives take risks that would lead to its failure, the government will never allow it to fail. It will always bail it out, which incentivizes extraordinary risk taking and incentivizes the, who leads corporations 87% uh, uh, white, 85% um, white men, to act recklessly and know that there will be no repercussions for that action. So in reality, uh, what Cheryl, um, Steve, and I propose is first a very low scale or easy improvement, we think, and then some large scale resolution that we hope might change the way that uh, we do corporate law in the United States. First of all, there needs to be a textbook drafted that's critical. There is not a critical corporate textbook that exists. So that's going to fall off the shoulders of Cheryl, Steve, and I. We need to write a textbook that discusses all of these issues. Um, so the good news is we've begun to. Um, we will have a textbook that at least three of us will adopt for our students that talks about the failure of corporate America to really represent America. The diversity doublespeak, the the white male supremacy in the corporate boardroom, the privatization. Whenever I talk to my students about private prisons, again, and, and when I speak to I speak to church groups and other, uh, everyone's astonished. Um, but for whatever reason, the lay person does not know that we're allowing both education and prison to be privatized for profit. And those incentives are perverse, and most of us are unaware. Um, my students are typically astonished, and then they're up in arms, which I think we should be. Um, so first step is to draft this critical corporate textbook and take on the authors that have abdicated responsibility to be critical in the textbooks um, that they already uh, published. Um, the good news also, if there is good news in this, is that as Steve, Cheryl, and I are now more on the senior end of being uh, law professors, there are a lot of young, aggressive, corporate law professors of color. And so as that group grows, our hope is that there will be, not necessarily to sell our books, but the hope is that the, the, me the message of d diversity and critical corporate law will, will expand you know, much further beyond the schools that Steve Shadow and I teach at. So that's one point. The other point um, that we think is very important is that we need to lead, if you will, a type of, we, we meaning the community, the law professoriate community of color, <laughs> some, some type of activist revolution where, I, I didn't even mention that the Correctives Corporation of American Geo Group actually used prison labor to increase their profits. You probably know that prisoners sew Victoria's Secrets garments, put together Starbucks holiday packages, and they do it for either no pay or for 50 cents an hour or 75 cents an hour, which allows Starbucks and Victoria's Secret to slap a Made on America label onto the products while they enter, let's say, a $10 million contract with a prison in Indiana, and all of the money goes to the, to the corporation, and 50 cents an hour goes to the prison. So if you're following what I'm saying, you know, basically involuntary servitude or slavery exists in our prisons in the United States. And corporate America profits based on it, and most of us don't know this. Um, so 
I actually believe, I mean, I, I actually believe, I, 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 for whatever reason, my parents raised us with pickets in our hands and marching. And I actually think if we were to do a sit-in in Victoria's Secret, or if we were to boycott Starbucks, they would probably immediately drop their affiliation with private prisons. And they wouldn't want that negative publicity of being affiliated with building their product on the backs and their profits on the backs of free labor in prisons. So we believe that a broader resolution might become uh, engaging in activist protest. And who better to engage and lead activist protest than, than us, law professors and law students, as they learn about sort of all of these sort of wild ways that American law incentivizes and props up white male supremacy, entrenched elitism amongst uh, corporate America uh, in this day and age. So to conclude and go back to where we started, this is the picture that corporate America wants you to believe is happening at their firms. Uh, this is the picture that's actual, at, that, that's actual. And once I showed this to my students, I think there's two women, how much is that, five, 10, 14, uh, so, so 12 are white men. One of my students, raised his hand and said, if this group is sitting around a boardroom table talking about increasing the number of prisoners, lobbying for harsher laws and sentencing laws, now di directing their efforts towards putting um, immigrants in, in, into prison and exploiting prison labor, we're actually talking about, and, and who's in prison? We're actually talking about white men, older white men, strategizing on how to imprison young black and brown men. That's the truth, in my view. We're talking about, that sounds to me like the 1800s. That sounds to me like, like what this country was founded on, which was on the backs of slavery. And now we have white corporate executives strategizing on how to imprison more young black and brown men, and increasingly black and brown women. That's how our laws are focused. Um, that's who we put in jail. So uh, I guess the message and our hope today is that we can, we can figure out ways to put a stop to it. And the first way to do it, not to self-aggrandize, but because a lot, I think we as law professors think we're, we're, we're maybe more important than we are, but the first thing is to, to, to write a textbook. And the second thing is to begin to make law students aware. And then the third thing is to try and be activists and lead the activism. And the fourth thing would be for us to put ourselves in positions to lead so that we can sit on these boards. If, 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 if I sit on bo several boards, none of which I get paid to do, so they're not the corporate boards that I'm talking about. But if we could lead on boards, we could change things, um, I think, in my view. So anyway, Nick and I are grateful for you, you being here and listening to us today. And we have a whole bunch of time for a conversation if you all are um, interested in engaging. So thank you. Yes. The long question. Um, so, kind of looking at the like lack of diversity in um, like, corporate boards, like how much of that maybe is like generational? That like these are kind of like, older white dudes and will actually you know, like not be in those positions anymore. And maybe how much of that um, depends on like the industry um, and like kind of how like um, the like major industries are kind of changing. Um, cause I rem but then kind of on the flip side, I remember a few months ago, some diversity reports came out about like Google and Facebook, and it was kind of found that the majority of not just their leadership, but that their um, employees were all like white men. And I think that surprised a lot of people because tech seems like a more, like, I guess, like, accessible field. Like, 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 it's something that's, yeah, that like, has to be more diverse than it should have been more diverse. And then also, you kind of have. Um, like VCs and VC firms, and those all tend to be kind of very wealthy white men, and they kind of, you know, since they find tech, they all, you know, they very much determine the direction that tech goes into, and kind of maybe like the role, like what the implications of that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I think I think you would expect Facebook when Zuck Zuckerberg went public, you would have expected Facebook and Google and Yahoo to actually be diverse. You would expect it, and they weren't. You know, Sheryl Sandberg's made her chops because she was the only female that in Facebook, I think, that sort of 
you know, started this Facebook revolution, and Google and Yahoo just appointed Melissa Mayer yesterday, last year, the year before, to be their first female CEO. Um, but the pro I, I, I hope, my hope is that changing generations will say, you know, no more. My friends and hopefully diverse friends are people that sit on boards, but the problem for the near term is that current boards nominate who's going to sit on boards with them. It's supposed to be a shareholder responsibility. Shareholders are supposed to name and vote on who sits on the board of directors, but it becomes extraordinarily difficult for a group of shareholders to put a slate of their own candidates up against the slate that's put up by the sitting board. And so if you're a sitting board, and I'm sorry to, to do this, but if, if you're this sitting board, if you're this sitting board, who are you gonna put up to sit on the board with you? And who you're going to put up are people that you know, that are in your circles, that are your friends. And if I were to go to, let's say, IBM's board, I went to IBM's board this morning and Disney's board, most of the board members are CEOs of other Fortune 500 companies. So if you're a huge, important corporation and you want the CEO of an important company on your board, who are those 85? Your choice are white males. And so in the short term, I'm pessimistic because corporate boards continue to renominate and recycle the same people. And um, traditionally these folks are um, you know, older white men. But there have been some studies done, uh, you, you may or may not be aware, that in Norway and in the EU they've passed laws that say a certain percentage of women must sit on corporate boards by 2020, uh, if you will. But in Norway it's 40%. And in the EU, it's, um, I don't know what, the, what, what, what their particular law is, but they're making affirmative efforts to diversify boards. And what, although the research seems to be all over the place, there are some really hopeful indications that more diverse boards are more profitable. They have better corporate governance policies. They think harder about risk than when you have group think. And, and my, you know, this, this is just a total stereotypical guess, but my guess is there's some pretty serious group thing going on with this group right here. Um, not very many diverse views, not very many diverse views about how to increase profit or what have you. Um, so my hope is to, to, to your specific question that, that as our generation and as our, our youth and our young leaders grow up, that they will be more committed to diversity but that, that's the problem. I believe that law, lawyers become some of the most important political and corporate leaders, and they're sitting in corporate law classrooms, and none of this is being challenged that they're getting in their corporate law textbooks. So they're, they're not getting a critical perspective. They're assuming that how it is is sort of how it should be, uh, which is why, to me, it seems so critically important to try to, try to get a wedge in there and start helping students see it differently. So I actually, I want to push back against that a little bit, <coughs> just in terms of, I guess, my experience with people that are trying to diversify their boards. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering how much of this is a kind of a supply side problem, to mm. use that economics metaphor, right? Yeah. But, um, well, and it seems to me that there are two issues. One is that when you're talking about places like Disney or um, Service Master, Service Master um, they have histories of being family-run companies. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about labor and how labor has been racialized in the United States, it seems like you are already, I mean, when you're trying to protect those companies, you're protecting labor that has already been racialized and is protecting that kind of um, wealth. Um, and then the second thing is, um, it seems to me to be a diversity problem um, in terms of who the pool is. Um, so what industries have um, ample representation of women and people of color, um, and to what extent do you, um, I guess to what extent do um, do people that make for diverse boards even want to do those jobs, right? So to some degree, um, is there some self-selection out of that process? And so great, great points. Um, 
So when I get pushback, typically it's that you know if the Harvard Business School is, is putting out business leaders, then everyone, whatever the ethnicity or color or race that you bring to it, you're all going to think the same anyway. If you're coming from a certain perspective, it doesn't matter if there's different race or different gender, you're going to be on the same sort of mindset. Um, that's a pushback piece I get. And one of the things that you suggest here, I think, is an important question, which is. You know, is there a supply problem? Is there, are, are there people that are qualified to sit on these boards that are of color? Um, so one of the things that I, that I often like to argue is that, is that why does a board have to be made up of business people? Why does a board have to be made up of, you know, or, or, or primarily CEOs of companies? Why don't we have a law that says, let's have labor sit on the board of directors? And let's have a law professor or a, or a uh, or, or, or a you know medical uh, professor or sit on a board of directors. Why does the board have to be the way it's constituted now? Because because my view is good business is not rocket science. Um, there are some things that we don't want long, but we don't you know nuclear physics. I know a few nuclear physicists, and you know I'm not trying to mess with 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 that. But why don't we have diversity in board seats rather than it being a certain kind of people? And that completely, in my view, alleviates this supply problem. Because there are tons of diverse opportunities with labor and tons of diverse opportunities with law, law professors or people or business professors that would understand going forward. But, but, we, but we force ourselves into this pool that may not be diverse and that includes lots of people, even of color, that think the same way. So my diversity is not just racial, um, uh, it's viewpoint, and it's worldview, and it's, um, and it's across the board. So, uh, you know, one of the things we could do is think hard about what Norway and the EU have done, and think hard about how corporate leadership really, whether corporate leadership really leads us properly. I mean, I would have, I, I frankly would have loved to have seen what would have happened if Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley continued to exist, because that's what would have happened in the 2008 financial market crisis. If we not bailed them out, they would have failed. What would we have put in their place? Maybe some government-run banks? It would, I would have liked to have seen a world without Goldman Sachs as the dominant corporate figure in the United States, just to see. But we, we, we seem to continue to be of the mindset that you know, without Wall Street, we can't possibly be um, you know, economically grounded in the United States. So, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I, I hear what you're saying. I appreciate what you're saying. I think part of the response to that is that we need to think more broadly about who sits on boards. And part of that is we need to um, really infuse our pools with people of color and be really open to, to different viewpoints. One other statistic that's, that's important to your question is sometimes when boards are very diverse, there's lots of friction on the board when the boards don't seem to be cohesive and can't come to resolutions because there's so much um, different points of view and what have you. And so that's also what some people would point to as a problem of diversity on boards is that they can't seem to be a cohesive unit in running the company on a going forward basis. And so there's lots of research out there that seems to indicate you know, both positives and negatives when you have diversity. But, um, I, I, well, one last comment. Almost every board and executive on our Wall Street banks decided to invest deeply in mortgage-backed securities of dubious value. And in my view, it was mostly a money grab. There didn't seem to be anyone in the room saying, do you appreciate this risk and the fact that this could capsize our company? There didn't seem to be anyone in the room saying that. And my hope would be that had I been in the room, I would have said, do you appreciate that there is no value in these mortgage-backed securities and that we are in a teetering uh, mortgage market and may have been able to influence people to think differently about it, but it was grabbing money. Uh, I think Charles Prince, the CEO, of, or Dick Fold, one of the CEOs of one of the banks said, you know, got to get while the getting's good, the music's playing, you know, it'll stop playing, but let's we'll grab it while we can. I mean, that was the mindset of the financial market. Thank you. Yes, please. Right. Um, just to piggyback a little bit on that supply and demand um, paradigm, having spent many years in corporate America, supply and demand, I used to say about 
business and trying to go up the corporate ladder as a African American uh, female. It was like the game was basketball. Once I learned how to play basketball, I showed up and they changed it to football. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the qualifications are not as static and sit in concrete like a rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to hire a rocket scientist, I can take off some qualifications mm -hmm. that they absolutely must have. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same thing about the board of directors of a corporation. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, what you're looking for in business, and as a shareholder, I want someone on that board that's going to not only give the, have the uh, sightfulness and be able to give the oversight, but also can increase the bottom line of that corporation mm -hmm. and increase my value, my share value. Mm -hmm. So it's not as set in concrete. You can even, as you said, among the labor force, someone who spent 30 years in that business, don't tell me that they're not as qualified as someone from another corporation that doesn't even know my business to sit on the board. So. Yeah, I agree with that on the qualification. The privatization of prisoner, prisons, and I wanted to say, and I hate to say, these same chairs and uh, tables, I like to show up with my own chair, <laughs> but these same tables and chairs that you're sitting in may have been made by a prisoner. Because we are a state school, and we, yes, but we are a state school, and they do purchase from prisoners. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, this privatization thing is just a little crazy. Now, my understanding of the 13th Amendment, it got rid of slavery, it got rid of it every place except for if you are incarcerated, you can be a slave. I posit that that was intentionally done like we had compromises when uh, Roosevelt came out with the, the New Deal, there were compromises because they wanted to exclude African Americans. I think that that 13th Amendment had some compromises and the South was going to rise again. They weren't going to get rid of slavery that easy. Mm -hmm. And this was just another way mm -hmm. of making sure it was implemented. Mm -hmm. And with the high incarceration, especially of African American males, especially down south, I mean, they do things. My brother uh, said on his son, well, he's retired now, but was on the Richmond uh, police force for 28 years. And he talks about now about simple things that he heard here in California or in Los Angeles would not do, but people still there today getting caught with a joint and being given, you know, sentences of a year in the local jail. Come on. You know, I mean, they obviously don't have the overcrowding that we have in Los Angeles. A year with that in, in the year 2014. So I, um, I really think it is a way to increase and get free labor, mm -hmm. that slavery lives on through the prisoners. Now I wanted to thank you so much for your comments. I wanted to just mention two things that it was 1970s that we had the war on drugs named yeah. and that the Corrections Corporation of America came into being. And, and, and I, I guess I actually do have this slide right here. So, so 1970s. And this is what's happened since, 1970s, yes. and this is what's happened since. Um, so, I, so one of the things that, that you know, Michelle Alexander talks about in the New Jim Crow is that much like uh, was just mentioned here about the 13th Amendment, I mean, when the Civil Rights Act passed in 1965, we were talking about a new day, a new day of voting rights and civil rights, and then suddenly, we have a war on drugs. And suddenly, as Michelle Alexander says, the war on drugs is waged in inner city communities, not in frat houses. I often like to say I grew up, it's, it, I can't believe I had said this till now, I grew up here. I grew up coming to, I grew up in, in uh, Carson and in, in, uh, South Central Los Angeles. I used to surf with 
friends at Redondo and Manhattan beaches. And here's the thing. When I was with my surfer friends, primarily white, they smoked a lot of marijuana, and they never got stopped or apprehended or searched. My African-American and Polynesian friends, gangsters, were smoking lots of J's, and we got stopped all the time and laid out, laid out on the ground, and our car searched constantly um, to the point that we're waging a war discriminatorily in a way to incarcerate individuals that are now free prison labor. So, 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 so to me, the privatization, the, 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 the creation of CCA and, and the uh, proclamation of the war on drugs are two of the most nefarious ways to resubordinate people of color that had just received sort of a green light to vote and elect and be a part of uh, American society. So it's much deeper and more nefarious, as you yeah. suggested, than simply, you know, prison companies trying to make money, um, I think. Thank you. What is the you, I'm sorry, Nick, do you have? Oh, I want you to jump in. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I shall jump. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's, there, there is this visual element to this question of, of slavery seeming to come back. When we think about slavery in terms of the origins of this country, you know, the slave house would often sit on top of a hill, and the, the slaves would work in the fields, and they were viewable from the master's house. And, and it seems to me that we're seeing this mirrored uh, in, in the prison, uh, the ways in which people are surveilled inside the prison, and the, the white warden can watch all of the prisoners of color. And then there's this idea of the uh, corporate um, boardroom uh, at the top floor of this great corporation, 30 stories up in the air, um, peering down uh, at the prisons and, and all of the cheap and exploited sources of labor uh, that really seem to mirror in, in, in different ways um, the legacy of slavery's visual elements in terms of positioning the white master in relation to people of color. Um, and, and I also have, I have, a, I have a question or comment. Her oh. first, she started. Okay. No. So, <laughs> what, what is the percentage of uh, people of color uh, who are in prison versus um, whites? And I'm so very much aware of the uh, privatization of prisons, and I've been aware of this. But the, the, the jump to say, and this is where maybe I'm ignorant of learning, I, I have heard that stated that it is a, an intentional way to imprison people of color. And I have to say, until today, I've struggled with, uh, I guess because I don't want to accept that, mm -hmm. it's such a horrible thought. Mm -hmm. We have to evolve much further than that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very challenging assumption for me to accept. So I think I've kind of twisted that a little bit to think that it, it's more of a coincidence, it's more of a, you know, it, maybe there's more law enforcement in, in, uh, in, in uh, you know, in areas that are, uh, typically have a lot of crime, and because those areas tend to be of higher, you know, less white people, more people of color, you get this sort of correlation. Um, but this idea that it's, it's actually institutionalized oppression, it's really that forcefully, you know, intentional, is, is really a fascinating point, and I, I'm not doubting it. I just, I, I guess I'm really hoping it's not true. Yeah, no, it's so, so in terms of percentages, I, I guess what you know, what are the, what is the evidence of that being you know the intentional uh, force there, and then you know what are sort of the, the proof of that, and 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 how did you uh, reach that conclusion on the data? Um, so, so this slide here shows the population uh, by race in the United States. Uh, nearly 75 percent is uh, in the U.S. is still uh, white. And I'd say maybe approximately 13% is African American and Latino. And then this next slide here is the incarceration rate, um, where the incarceration rate of whites is far below 75%, far below 50%. And if you put African American and Latinos together, they probably make up 66% of the prison population. So, you know, I, I shared an anecdote about surfers and gangsters and, you know, being arrested for marijuana. The, 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 the hyper-policing of inner city communities based on this perception of crime being more prevalent or present there is something that if Donald Tibbs were here with us today, he'd talk about. But it, Ronald Reagan, in declaring the war on drugs, incentivized local police forces to wage the war on drugs by telling them you will get federal money and federal weaponry 
if you actually decide to make the war on drugs a primary priority, how is it that local police forces have tanks and battering rams and um, you know all types of these things? It was because we gave the, the federal government provided that to them. Michelle Alexander makes the point. Now, I would, I would, if you haven't read the New Jim Crow, that's probably where you're going to see a lot of this evidence um, that it's a purposeful um, direction. Um, and also, there's this book by, by Bernard Harcourt called The Illusion of Free Markets, where he talks also about the freer the markets, sort of the more incarceration there seems to be uh, in the United States. And he makes this really interesting connection. But Michelle Alexander and I would argue that the war on drugs was waged in, in powerless communities. It, if they were to wage the war on drugs at UCLA frat houses, where kids are smoking J's, they're not going to put a single one of those kids in jail because their parents are going to lawyer up. They're going to, um, uh, you know, ma make it such that the, the I guess the statistic that, that permeates the most of me is that drug use is basically percentage consistent across race. However many people use drugs, it's you, if you look in prison and watch TV, you're going to think Latinos and African Americans use drugs at hugely higher proportional rates than white people, but that's not true. It's about something like 10 or 11% across races. That's the size of the population that does drugs. And yet, we imprison at this rate primarily based on drugs. So that's evidence to me of this hyper-policing of poor communities where, where you can actually go and scoop up a bunch of kids, um, bust them for small amounts of drugs without an ability of parents to lawyer up, protect their kids, fight against you know what it what it is. So in my view, it's the way that the war on drugs has been waged that leads to this sort of intentional purpose. And now, now I'm not saying that local. My brother's a police officer in uh, Salt Lake City, so I'm not saying that, that that local police officers are like let's throw in as many black and brown people as we can. But the way that the war on drugs has been incentivized and prosecuted has led to that with some thinking that it's been political intentions of of uh, Nixon, Reagan, and others to sort of, you know, if felons voted, Al Gore would have been president by a long shot. If felons voted, you know, there probably wouldn't have been a Republican elected in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. But felons don't vote because part of this incarceration thing is if you're a felon and you get out, you can't vote. So, so, so there's a lot of politics and Michelle Alexander connects the dots, I think, in a way that, that, that will make your worst thinking actual. And I, th oh, uh, I think it's important to, to remember the institutional aspects of racism. Um, you know, so, so, you know, as Dre's discussing, it, it's not a coincidence. We tend to talk about racism now as this postmodern, post-racial thing. It's just out there, man, in the ether, and racism is going to come get us. Something uh, doesn't exist, or either of these, either sides of this argument. But we have to realize that you know there are policies in place that encourage people uh, or, or discourage people um, from participating in the economy, in the criminal justice system. And so, when we see boards that are made up of mostly white. Um, Folks, that's because there are there are policies and, and economic prerogatives that generate or encourage this sort of action, and so you know I think that we should look at police departments and say, if it's true, which it is, that there are contracts to fill prisons to ninety percent capacity, then of course people are going to be out there trying their best to arrest certain people because they they have incentive. The police departments have incentives to arrest people. Um, they also want to arrest people that won't offend the white corporate board. Uh, imagine if your, your police department in Los Angeles just came to the prisons uh, with nothing but white people. There would be an upheaval. It would be a horrible idea. But, um, but as long as we continue to uh, bring people to prison who don't look like the people who control prison, those people who are in control of prisons remain happy. Well, I was going to say something to you, President. Um, I mentioned that my brother was a cop. He started out as a vice cop in uh, narcotics and undercover. They recruited him right when he got out of school out of BCU, Virginia Commonwealth University there in Richmond. Um, he's come, since he's retired, he's come to a whole different view of what he did for 28 years because his stepson was arrested for smoking or having a joint 
he was riding with his girlfriend. His stepson is part of an interracial couple. His girlfriend is white. It was her car. They got pulled over by the police. The joint uh, was in the ashtray. They searched the car. They smelled the throat. They searched the car. They found it. They took them both to jail. When uh, my brother went down, got his stepson out, the girl's mother came and got her out. When they went to court, the girlfriend got a admitted guilty. Okay, my the stepson, his stepson was a passenger in the car. She owned the car. She was driving the car. She admitted guilt, pled guilty, no problem, no contest. Exactly, which no problem. She got a fifty dollar fine. His stepson, no, nothing else, had never been in trouble before. Uh, was scared to death to use my brother's name. I you know, my stepdad's a cop. He wasn't going to go there. Um, stepson got thirty days. Had never been in trouble before in a Virginia courtroom. Why? Don't know. Then I draw you to, which has been a controversy here that many people have been fighting, uh, crack versus cocaine, and the sentencing that one gets with when caught with crack versus being caught with cocaine. And I don't use drugs. I don't know. I mean, I'm a little older than probably a bigger than anything. But, um, I don't use drugs either. <laughs> <laughs> but come on, tell me what that difference is. Yeah. 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 I, I think um, I'm just kind of also curious how much of your research or work has maybe shown that the um, more of the corporate structure and the profit motive behind that mm -hmm. um, is driving this sort of trend mm -hmm. versus uh, specifically race and, and mm -hmm. more to that, the paradigm behind yeah. each of those. Yeah. So it's, it becomes kind of a catch-22 mm -hmm. and it's like the chicken or the egg. And, and so that's where I always get uh, kind of frozen. Uh, you keep peeling it back and you say, well, it's exactly, a, it is a race thing. Mm -hmm. And it is a race thing. But is it is it also more the paradigm thing? And this is where the profit motive is so great, as you described. And that was revealing in terms of these people are used for free labor, basically. Um, you're going to have a harder time getting maybe white kids from Malibu or Santa Monica to be free labor without a major uproar. So I, I do wonder how much that play is, is more economic um, and and uh, paradigm uh, in terms of where you're going to get the least resistance to fulfill your, your corporate profit end goal versus actually just being purely race. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I were African American but I lived in the Palisades, mm -hmm. um, what I would kind of think I might be equally immune mm -hmm. uh, to getting into the, the prison mm -hmm. system because I will be able to put up a fight. Mm -hmm. So that this is where you know disenfranchised versus empowered. Such such a good question. So so let me let me answer it by a by a, a quick. Um, anecdote from my research. Um, it, it seems like, and I'm really, really hopeful about this, but it seems like the war on drugs might be losing steam, right? Eric Holder came out a year ago and said, we will no longer prosecute low-level marijuana possession crimes. I will not allow that to be a priority any longer for a federal prosecutor. So that's a good sign. Um, Kat, I, 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 would, I, said, I said what I'm about to say now in front of the concerned clergy of Indianapolis, and it didn't go over well, but I said that Colorado and Washington State are hopeful for me that they've legalized marijuana. You know, and the concerned clergy wasn't, wasn't hearing that. Um, but, but the fact that, that states are supposed to experiment, you know, and kind of see, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that we can figure out a way to decriminalize, that's the word that the clergy wanted to hear, decriminalize marijuana, not legalize it necessarily. The private prison corporations see the writing on the wall. The war on drugs is going away. We are no longer going to be able to, to just incarcerate thousands and hundreds of thousands of people on the war on drugs. They have literally shifted their focus. And the next profit motive for them is immigrants. Yes. NPR reported that two lobbyists were in a small border town in Arizona went to the mayor 
and said, let us build a prison here in your town. We will bring economy to you. We will provide jobs. And the mayor said, who the, who the hell are you going to put in prison? Um, we're a teeny tiny border town. And the lobbyist said, quote, we will fill it with Mexicans. So it is the profit motive based on the least likely party to battle and fight against it. It's a power thing and it's a profit thing. And I'm telling you right now, Cesar uh, Hernandez Garcia at uh, uh, Denver right now is doing incredible work on what's called crimmigration. Now where we're criminalizing immigration, where it's now we're, we're, we're the, the private prison industry, I believe, thinks that they are going to fill their jails with brown people that are here either illegally or create a, a, or, or, or engage in some kind of a crime. And, and evidence of that is that SB 1070 is the Arizona Show Your Papers law. Um, it was drafted by lobbyists, handed to a legislature in Arizona who submitted the bill verbatim, Russell Pierce, lunatic, got defeated in the last election. Um, 32 sponsors jumped on in Arizona, unheard of in Arizona, and 31 of them have received campaign contributions from CCA and the GEO group. So we're talking about ball profit grabbing over populations that don't have power. So it's, I think it's both. I do think it's race, I do think it's race coordination, but it's also about the bottom line. And I don't think that if the cor Corrections Corporation Board in America were loaded with women and people of color, they would be, I just, I, my hope is they wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> so I, I agree with what you're saying, and I, I guess I feel a little less hopeful that if you were loaded with women, then it would be, uh, yeah. that it would change terribly much, unless the paradigm of the the woman and the um, you know uh, you know the African American person is actually in a different paradigm. Yeah. I yeah. I really liked the point made about. Um, and I think your point about you know the diversity of, of professional voices, the diversity of profession of different paradigms. Mm -hmm. But I, I also can't get past the fact that the stagnation you have, the conflict you have, uh, because you're so diverse that you don't ever have any baseline that you all start with. Well, but I, I if, if I can interrupt really yeah. quickly, at the end of the day, corporations exist to maximize profits. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So, so that's so so that's what you're. That's what you're sent, that's what you're charged to do as a board member. And you know, if board members are making hundreds of thousands, or if not millions of dollars, then then you you're not gonna wanna implement policies that are, aren't gonna increase your bottom line. So so it's a real catch twenty two that's not the right word, but it's a real dilemma or conundrum for people that sit on boards that have a social conscience, I think. Let's go go ahead. That's good. Um, but uh <laughs> I have something for you here at UCLA. Um, Kayla Hernandez, she does research in mass imprisonment. She's teaching right now a course on mass imprisonment. And o, uh, A. Horibias here at UCLA, Chicanos and the War on Drugs, is teaching it right now. There's a, there's a lot of research on it. So those two professors are current, doing current research. And exactly what you said, the new, the new African American, the new Negro is um, brown people. Um, they are taking the place of slavery, the whole immigration thing. And he makes a point of that as a lot about that in these courses. Yeah. Meaning they're like they're perpetuating the problem, or they're 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 staying socially conscious. No, they're the new people that are being are the victims, so to speak. Oh, they're the new slaves. <laughs> they're the new slaves. So I wanted America. to I wanted to thank everyone. Do you have a final comment? Oh, I I, I do want to say that in, in terms of uh, coming back to Grace's point about the, the need to be activists, we we've got to do something. Uh, and, 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 and we are, are all very good at going to conferences and giving talks and asking questions and, and then uh, or rinse, wash, and repeat or what have you. Um, what, what, what do you rinse, wash, and repeat? Uh, yeah, the beard. Uh, the beard. <laughs> um, 
But, but, I, but I think, um, to your point, there is this question of, you know, what do we do in the face of racism and capitalist oppression? And this is actually at, at the nexus of a lot of my work. And, and I think that we need to, as opposed to viewing ra anti-racist coalitions or anti-racist politics and anti-capitalist coalitions or anti-capitalist uh, politics, as opposed to each other, which happens in an unfortunate amount out there in the world, where we have these debates about, is it race first or is it class first? Is slavery motivated by race or is slavery motivated by profit? Mm -hmm. uh, instead of having these discussions, I think, that, you know, I think there's a real danger in being lost in, in this battle about which came first or what is the origin of X. We really need to work together, um, no matter what our politics are, because it's true that capital is racialized. And it's also true that race is capitalized. Hmm. And I think that if we can combine these efforts that address at the same time, and, and in some ways this follows kind of the intersectional politics of one of our guests here, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, we have to work at these things together as opposed to viewing them as distinct or discrete categories of oppression. And if we're able to do that, I think that we can more meaningfully move towards challenging things like mass incarceration and crimigration. Um, and until we do that, if we continue to see these issues as only a race or only a capital problem, problem we're going to be in trouble in terms of engaging in the necessary activism to have a more ethical world. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Really great comments. Um, and Nick and I are totally engaged. So if you want to stay in touch or communicate going forward, the, the last point I would make is, is uh, I come to these conferences and I go away fired up. Um, and the, the important thing is that we take the fired up to the streets. You know, that it's not just a fired up intellectual thing, but it's a fired up activist thing. And I'm happy to report that, that a lot of these uh, uh, invitations I received to these churches and other groups um, entail uh, folks that, that come up to me afterwards and, and are interested in letter writing campaigns and protesting and doing those types of things. And that's why I think we need to go next. Um, so anyway, thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate the dialogue. Thank you.